Hello, I'm Somi Aryan. I'm the founder of the FemPeak platform, where visionary women come to gain live access to global leaders, learn about the macroeconomic landscape, and stay ahead of the curve. My guest on today's podcast is Terry Duhan, an inspirational woman in finance who sits on a number of boards for Morgan Stanley in Europe. She's also an author, an educator, and international speaker. I'm proud to say that at FemPeak, we have recently brought on board Morgan Stanley as one of our corporate partners. So naturally, I was pleased to be introduced to Terry, and I jumped on the opportunity to interview her for my podcast. I had so many questions for Terry, in particular about raising investment as a woman and how women could build a stronger network and support each other. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Terry Duhan. One of the first questions that I want to ask you um, is why do you think women who uh, reach a level of success don't support other women? This is what I'm, I'm noticing a lot, right? Like now um, we have, uh, for example, uh, with Fempeak, we have 30 or so investors so far, only four or five of them are women and, the, and they are all my close friends. You know, so when we get introduced to um, to other people, uh, most of the time, you know, there are many people who have come through, uh, like either it's been called outreach through me, you know, one of my called outreach uh, uh, to somebody that I didn't know ended up being, you know, he invested 75,000 um, pounds. And, uh, but same thing with women, it doesn't happen in general. Uh, and same thing with also, uh, when we get introduced to companies, um, you know, the whenever I get introduced to companies uh, for uh, you know for, to get corporate partnership with them, um, every time I get in, introduced to a man, uh, they do support and they really go out of their way. They try to uh, you know introduce us. Um, whereas when we get introduced to a woman usually they they don't even take it to the next level um they don't even make and make the next introduction um it really baffles me it's something that i want to write an article about you know and i recently one of my interviews in forbes came out and i next interview you know uh, or, or article around that i want to write about it but i'm really now researching it to see why that is because it, i don't understand um uh, why so um so so i think Part of me wonders if your fact set is very specific. So um, you're talking about a space where you're not seeing as many women as men financially support um, some of your female entrepreneurs. And so part of the issue there will be that um, women are not as financially independent as men. And um, there's a there's a whole number of reasons why that's the case, you know, and and it starts with things like um, uh, the unconscious bias against women that we're not very good with numbers. Yeah. So so finance is seen not only as very number specific, but also very male dominated. So many, many women self-select out. And what that means is that for their own financial independence, so even if they're making money, they feel uncomfortable in the space of even managing their own money. Um, And so there are less women as a result who are financially independent and have the ability, even women that are very successful, have the ability or confidence to put their money behind things they believe in. And... um, and so that's that may be part of the, the challenge you're facing. And, you know, so we have to think about the fact set and what actually, could be driving that. Actually, let's let's pause on that one for a second, because I think you're so right. Because when I'm looking at the, the five women that invested, they are all the breadwinners in their family. Well, we could, we could talk about that as well, because, you know, in New York, in New York, the dirty secret among very senior women is that the majority are either they are the the breadwinners in their family and maybe their husband doesn't work um, or their husband has the the secondary job or they're they're not married or they don't have kids. So all of the social pressures 
that many women feel, many women who, who, who are eventually, who do get married and who, who have children, they have these social pressures, which are that women are supposed to be the primary caregiver, whether that's of your husband or your children or his parents or your parents or um, whatever the, the, the pressure, the socialization is that that's the role we fill. And so women who don't go down that route are a little bit freer from those, those pressures. And as a result, have a little bit more opportunity to explore the success in, ahead of them. Now, it doesn't mean that the women who are, are married or have kids or, or have obligations um, of any sort, it doesn't mean that they're not capable or able to be successful. What it means, though, is that the compromise they have to make in their daily lives, given the, the hard work that they're expected to put in in the office, doesn't always feel appropriate. And so when you're fighting as a woman, you're fighting for pay and promotion and recognition, and you're not getting it in equal doses as your male colleagues, and you're having to compromise on the, the social responsibilities you feel, um, that's when many women opt out or opt onto a different track. Mm -hmm. and, and so that is the, the, the sad fact. It's not that women get married and have children, it's, <laughs> yeah. that it's, it's that the compromise isn't worth it if they're not going to be treated fairly. Um, but the, the, that's the dirty secret of many, many senior women is that they don't have those social pressures. So they've been able to, to kind of put their energy into the fight. That's exactly why I decided not to have children. Exactly. Because I was like, there's no way that I could, you know, some people say, oh yeah, you can, it's possible. I don't think I could. Okay. That I couldn't do that. You know, every, everybody has, these are very intensely personal decisions. And the, the idea that, you know, I'm generically speaking about women getting married and having children, um, but it's not everybody's route, right? These are intensely personal decisions. And that there's a huge pressure to do, to do things um, for both women and men. Forget, you know, it's not just a gender issue. For all of us, there's huge social pressure to do certain things, behave certain ways. Um, you know, and personally, one of the things I say, for example, I, I am married and I have three children. I am also the primary caregiver. Um, and um, what I've learned about myself is that I would be a terrible full-time mother, a terrible, shocking full-time mother. Um, and I'm a fantastic, and you know, I, I, I hope, and I do my best every day, but I'm a fantastic part-time mother. And we all have to find the role that suits us in life. And, and the truth is, you will never move away from those social pressures. So as a woman, with children, I am as often asked why I'm working as why I'm not working enough. So I, there is, you know, why aren't you putting everything into your career because you can outsource child raising and you've got to represent for the, for the women around you, or why are you working at all? You know, you, you should be, you know, there's, there's unbelievable pressure on both sides. Yes. And so in, in the face of the fact that you can never get it right, right? <laughs> Any of yes. us, yes. You, you, you absolutely have to choose the path that's right for you, whatever that yes. is. That is super, super eye-opening because you just made me realize that it's not that women don't want to support. It's because they are usually not the independent financially, you know, they are usually, you know, most of the time, if their husband is the primary caregiver, if uh, not caregiver, say the primary uh, breadwinner. Oh, yeah. Yes. If, even if the woman works and makes money, they still ask for permission almost, um, you know, they still, you know, they say, let me talk to my husband. Whereas none of the five women that have invested have had to say, let me talk to my husband. None of them. They, they all decided for themselves. Um, whereas everybody else, uh, you know, that I have talked to, they were like, you know, let me talk to my husband or, you know, they've, they've had 
that those kinds of okay so this is good because you know a lot of times people are like and uh, you know maybe women don't want to support we'll, we will come to whether there is any truth to there there's one of the things that i when well, I let, me, let me interrupt you for a second because there, there's another piece of data that's interesting uh, <laughs> and, I, and then i have some anecdotes so I, I didn't see this research, so this is secondhand, um, but apparently there's research which shows that it's about our instinctive like or dislike of each other. And so apparently the research, the, the, um, the setup was get a bunch of women and put them randomly into a room with each other, let them chat for a few minutes, and then ask them what they thought about each other then get a bunch of men, put them in rooms with each other and let them chat for a, a few minutes and then ask them what they think of each other. And the end result was, and, and I'm sure there are all sorts of factors that drove this and, you know, depends on what, what particular jurisdiction, where these people were from, what their ages were. I'm, I'm sure there's all sorts of externalities, but the upshot was that when you put women together, they are less likely to like each other than men are. So men walk into a room, they meet another man, they chat for a bit, they come out and they're like, oh, great guy, nice guy. Yeah, I, you know, we could totally have beers together. Women meet and um, they come out and they are like, eh, not really my type. And um, I mean, and that, again, that's really Why interesting. Why do you think that is? I, I don't, I didn't see, again, I didn't see the research. Um, I don't know. I, I wonder if there is, um, you know, that natural, that everybody talks about women, that competitive thing we have going on, which is massively based on this idea of what cavemen looked like. <laughs> and mm -hmm. we wanted to be attractive so that we could get the strongest guy to have children with us so that he would feed us and look after our children. It's that it's a survival instinct thing. Um, and so we're competing with all the other women for that strong caveman. Um, um, I, I, don't, I don't feel that I'm doing that. <laughs> I know, I know, like I, I understand. I don't feel that at all. Um, but, you know, but, but I think, you know, since I heard about that research, I have been, monitoring every time I meet a new woman and thinking, what am I thinking? And then when I meet a man, what am I thinking? Um, and what I'm finding is that there's more judgment. You know, there's more judgment on women. What, what she looks like, what, of how course. she's dressed, you know, what, what she says, what she's achieved, whether she's, you know, hit these targets and there's less judgment on men. And I, and, and that judgment like, is from both men and women. Yeah, and it's from women. both men and women, you know, and I'm mm -hmm. I've, I've been listening to how people react when they see men and women. And, and, you know, you watch the news with someone and a news, a woman comes on and the commentary will often be, and this is, it's on social media, you can see it, you know, the commentary will be about what she looks like, not about what she said. And her age, the 30 year old. Age. So that like, like you would never you would never hear them say the 30 and, year old if it's a man. <laughs> and that and, and it's a very different commentary if it's a man. And so again, we've been socialized to be critical of women in a certain way, in a way that we're not critical of men. And so I think I don't personally think that it's something so fundamental that women can never be friends because we know that's not true. We know that, you know, the sisterhood and our tribe is more important than <laughs> anything. And that actually they're, they're always there, you know, there's, there's huge, we all know that instinctively that, that, uh, you know, the women around us that are part of our lives can be amazing in a way that, you know, is different from some of the, the male relationships we have. And so the, I don't believe at all that fundamentally we're not able to like each other, but I do think that socially and social media exacerbates this. I do believe that socially we've all absorbed some of this judgment and we do it without thinking. And so for, for me, it was a bit of a wake up call, like Terry, honestly, stop. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, just try to be as fair as you can 
and your engagement. And, um, you know, and it's, it's hard to buck. It's hard to push against what everybody else around you is doing and saying, but it's, it's critical, I think, for us. Yeah, absolutely. And now, can I say, and sorry, anecdotally, I have often heard this story about the queen bee or the you know lack of support from other women. Most of my experience has been incredibly positive, incredibly positive. And I've, I've had some amazing women, very senior to me, wanting to pull me up and support me. I've also had amazing men do the same thing, but just on the topic of women and the women I work with on the whole, you know, at board level and at exec level, there's real genuine interest in changing the status quo and getting women and minorities in a different place. Mm -hmm. And, um, I very rarely come across, and, and maybe I'm, I'm a bit of a force to be reckoned with. So when I start talking about diversity and someone doesn't look like they're, they're, they're on board, um, they might be afraid. So, so they might yeah. all be pretending, but, but you know, I let no one pass. You know, if we're talking about diversity, every person around the table better be on board, man, woman, child, and, um, and, you know, maybe I intimidate people into being supportive, but um, I'm okay guess, with that. I'm okay guess, with that. I'm okay with being intimidating. <laughs> I guess. I guess that um, because I am, you know, I I, uh, I I'm an immigrant, right? I, I wasn't even born in the UK. I was born in. Neither Iran. was I. I'm, oh, really? I guess. Well, I'm American, so I'm, oh, yeah, I'm also I'm, an immigrant. I'm a an economic immigrant. I came here for work. Okay. Yeah. Like, I'm. I, I came from Iran. Um, so. Uh, a little bit different from like you a, know. Little different, yeah. a little <laughs> right. bit different a little bit different yeah like you know with an Iranian passport there's not much you could do but now I'm a British citizen but um you know um I guess you know because I come from that background I tend to not beat that drum too much because I'm like okay then I I am from you know then I, the people think that I'm just advocating for myself but I guess that's one of the things like maybe as women we're not very good at advocating for ourselves sometimes. no but you know what one of the things I talk about a lot is not advocating for you but advocating for others because you know when we all at some point find ourselves in a position of power and of and and privilege and whether that's um you know you be you become more successful you have more of a voice um then when you use it for other people, it's empowering, right? When you use it constantly for yourself, it can be draining. And so, you know, I certainly, I talk about gender as, a, as an issue, but what I found is that when I talk broadly about women and minorities, um, it doesn't feel so much about me yes. as it does about everyone else. And, um, and, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm also very cautious that I can't be the woman who opens her mouth and talks about diversity every time, because then it, what happens, unfortunately, is that as soon as I open my mouth, there'll be a number of people who just switch off. Yeah. Because, the, you know, oh, diversity again, I've heard this, you know, and they walk away. So my... Um, my approach has been that what I bring to the table is something technical, is something different. Yeah. And it just so happens that I get to use that platform to talk about diversity um, in the same way that, you, you know, you've built a, a very technical, very, um, you know, financially savvy space where it happens to be based on diversity. But you so you you've done it in quite a. Um, subversive way you know so I go into universities and I talk about career opportunities in finance I talk about asset management I talk about fintech um, you know trends in in the financial space and then I get because of my background because I was a derivative trader I get a bunch of guys in the room right more guys than that always more men than women come to my talks which gives me a fantastic opportunity to talk about diversity. <laughs> so I lure them in with the technical topic and then I 
you know, and then I educate them on diversity subversively. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, definitely. That's, that's my goal. That's, that's definitely, that's the way to go. Um, I have uh, two questions at the same time, but one of them is the continuation of the previous topic. So we talked about, okay, we figured out the investment piece. We figured out why women invest less. The second part of it was even when we get introduced to companies, most of the time so far our um, experience has been that if we speak to heads of HR, which are usually women, we don't get anywhere. The way that we get in is when one of the CEOs, who is usually a white man in their 50s, may, makes uh, an introduction um, and you know they suggest that uh, they should look at you know how we are supporting women uh, in the workspace and, and helping them to get from mid-level to top level. And even when they are in top level, then to deal with the challenges of being in the top, because most of the time they'll be alone in a male dominated environment. But so why do you think that in the workspace, women okay. still- I've got an answer for you. So, so again, yes. So the majority of CEOs are male, white, um, older, and the majority of uh, much of HR is is female. And the the uh, personally, I think the the problem we have, and this is from observation as opposed to necessarily any research, the the challenge we have is that HR could be an unbelievably powerful force within an organization, can be a force of change. and and given the people centricity that we're all talking about at the moment and how important the individuals are in our organizations, um, HR should be always at the top table, but they're not. Mm -hmm. um, you don't always see the head of HR sitting at board level or sitting in the C-suite, right? You see That's the head so of HR. That's so strange. And, and it's crazy, right? Because so what happens is the business is not giving them authority to drive a people agenda. The business is not, is not giving them credibility, is not giving them the resources, is not hiring the right people in that space. And as a result, you get an, you get an HR, you know, whatever you want to call it, personnel, human resources, talent management. I, you know, there, there are all sorts of new acronyms for it, but you get a a space that is supposed to be about people, which is not about people. And it's mm -hmm. unfortunate. And um, and it's not their fault. You know, often these are people who, who are attracted to the space because they are people, people. They want to, you know, they want to think out of the box. They want to drive development and engagement, um, but they don't have the resources or the authority. And so, that okay, is so the challenge. So, okay, so one thing is that I noticed as well. So one thing is that they don't have the authority. I think there's another piece to it as well, because I wonder when, if it's a woman, because most of the time heads of HR tend to be women, if it's a woman who wants to advocate for let's do something for the women in our company, they feel less confident doing so. Um, they almost prefer it to come from a man. Well, look, and let's be, you know, I get incredibly frustrated when we talk about gender issues and the most senior person in the organization is a woman talking about gender issues. When we talk about race issues and, and you have a minority standing up talking about it, you know, the, the, the fact is that we need allies on this journey, right? Yes. Women didn't get the vote because they could give it to themselves. Women got the vote because men allow them to have the vote, right? So, you know, we need, we need white males on this journey and driving the change. And what happens is when a woman is advocating for women's issues, when, when a black person is advocating for, for race issues, we, you know, we end up preaching to the converted, Yeah. right? You know, we're in an echo chamber and we're, you know, fighting against the tide. And it is incredibly draining. It's, I mean, it's fatiguing and it's draining and it's frustrating. And the number of these, and don't get me wrong, things happen. You know, these, these senior women and minorities who kind of pick up 
the, the, the gauntlet and run with it, they do amazing things, but they get burnt out. They do. Because, yeah. You know, they get burnt out. And what we need is someone standing by their side and, you know, parting the waters a bit for them so that they can achieve more with less energy, you know, than they currently have to do. And so I, I'm absolutely a fan of, of every, every woman and minority that wants to stand up and fight the good fight, but I also know how fatiguing it is. It is. And frustrating because the pace of change is so slow, right? But, you know, when I've, the, the other issue is that when we don't see people that are senior enough, you know, so we see people mid to senior level. And actually what we need is the person at the top of every organization to say, I want to see change. And when I've seen that, I have seen real change, really yeah. impressive change. And that, you know, for me, that's the flag bearer for best practice is the person at the top has to own it and drive it and have accountability for every person beneath. Um, and when you see that, you can see amazing things. Exactly. Yeah, I've noticed that. That's exactly why I um, think that uh, the best possible scenario is to go straight to the people at the top. I feel really positive about our conversation because I was starting to get really frustrated and upset that women were not, um, you know, uh, supporting, you know, a lot of times women are like, yeah, this is amazing what you're doing, fantastic. But when it comes to actually, you know, supporting it, getting it into their... And can I, can I just throw in, I mean, it's tiring. You know, being a senior woman, fighting the good fight, and all the social responsibilities that we might have outside, it is tiring. And, you know, and, and let's not forget what the, the impact of the pandemic, you know, the last two years has just added tremendous stress to everybody and kind of anxiety. And so sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm very worried about what's about to happen over the next two years. I'm very worried about women dropping out of the workforce. I'm very worried about hybrid working and where women are, um, will be, uh, if they if they go hybrid and men are in the office shouting about how great they are and the women get sidelined, I'm very concerned about that. Um, I'm very concerned about the women who are leading the charge just getting fatigued and stepping aside or just slowing down. You know, I am, you know, the next few years could be A challenging. Step you know, we could go backwards. And I'm, I mean, we're starting to see the signs already. Unfortunately. And, which is why it can't just be our fight. You know, it ha everybody has to want to be on this journey. Um, and, you know, which is, so building allies is critical, right? It's yes. critical for all of us, you know, and I'm constantly, I will, in board meetings, um, I will ask someone else to make a point for me so that it's not always me. And that's such a good, that's such a know, good strategy. And can you teach me, how do you do that? So, <laughs> so, so, you know, I've, I've had a number of side conversations where I'll say, you know, I'm very unhappy with these numbers, whatever it is, uh, you know, the, the progress on these, on this data. Um, and I'm just, I don't think we're making enough progress. What do you think? And um, no one's gonna say, oh, this is great. Because it's not great. It's not great anywhere. You know, we're not moving fast enough. And so I'll say, look, I always feel like I'm fighting for this. But if you don't think it's great, I'd love to hear your voice instead of mine um, around the table. And, you know, and I'm giving permission to a white male to talk about diversity. And they're scared. The truth is they're scared. And you know, often they're afraid of using the wrong vocabulary. They're afraid of saying the wrong thing or not getting it right and then being completely destroyed publicly. But the truth is we have to help them on the journey. 
right? And, you know, I know this personally, as a woman, I was always comfortable talking about social mobility. I mean, I, I grew up in a trailer, right? I was always talk comfortable talking about social mobility. And I was always talking about comfortable talking about gender. Race was harder for me. I didn't want to get it wrong. And I sat down with a, a good friend of mine. He's um, in the NFL, actually, or he was in the NFL um, for 10 years. And, um, and I sat down and I was like, look, I, I don't know if I'm using the right words. You know, should I say, do I say black? Do I say people of color? Do I say, and he said, why does it matter? And I said, well, I want to get it right. I, I don't want to offend. And he's like, Terry, if you're fighting, if you're fighting and you want to do the right thing, you can't get it wrong. And he gave me not just permission, but, but confidence. And so I recognized that actually I've got to give that to the men around me as well. And, um, you know, and I've got to make it okay for them to say something. So for example, if they say something that's not entirely right, I can turn around and, and say, you know, I can get angry or I can take them aside and talk to them or I can educate. And, um, and I'm trying, to be less angry because <laughs> I'm pretty mad. I'm pretty angry. You know, I, I've watched this play out for 30 years and I've seen not enough change and I'm getting frustrated. I have a daughter, she's 10. You know, what world is she coming into? And, um, you know, and I, it matters a lot. And so getting angry sometimes is okay, but educating and bringing people with me will give me more leverage in the future is where I've come to. This is amazing. So you said you have a 10 year old daughter. So you have three children, you said, right? I have three kids. Yeah. That's amazing. And how did that affect your, or did it, do you, how did it affect your journey? Like, do you think that you would have gained more success, less success, uh, how do you define success, actually? It's a really good question. I don't believe it's had an impact on my level of success. Um, in a way, it's had a maybe it's had a positive impact on some of the choices I've made. And, um, you know, I was in a corporate, I was on the trading floor for 10 years. And at the end of that 10 years, I had my mama died and then I had my first child. And it was such a, um, such an emotional time. And I had been unhappy in the big corporate world for a long time, but I couldn't figure out what next. And to be honest, those two events were a bit of a kick to sort of say, you know what? this isn't working, figure out what's going to work. And, um, you know, life is short and, you know, there are many other things that matter here, figure out what's going to work. And so I thought to myself, you know what, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. This is it. Take the opportunity. Let's give it a go. I initially actually thought that being an entrepreneur would be great because it would be my own time frame, And so I could, See, see my child when I wanted to see my child and, you know, do the business when I wanted to do the, that's not how it works, of course. Being an entrepreneur, um, you know, you're at the, the behest of your clients. So if your clients want to see you in the morning, you see them in the morning. If they want to see you in Canary Wharf or in New York City or in Kuala Lumpur, that's where you go. And um, uh, if, you know, you need to be in New York for two weeks, you need to be in New York for two weeks and you work as much as you can, because you're building a brand around yourself, you're building something and it takes energy. And I was a driven person. I couldn't see how to do it at less than a thousand miles an hour. I didn't, I didn't understand that world. So I worked really hard. Um, so having my first child gave me an impetus to do something different, but it didn't change my approach, I think. I then made my next choice, my next career choice, my third career to be portfolio career based on the idea of wanting more flexibility, but wanting to retain my seniority. Um, 
and wanting that intellectual engagement, that stimulation that drives me, you know, the, the interest. Um, that was a really hard transition to make from being an entrepreneur to sitting on boards. I did that. And so now I have more flexibility. What's interesting is that that flexibility and that extra time gives me the opportunity to give back, to do things like this, to put myself out there as a role model, to think about what next. Um, so in a way, having children has forced me to be more efficient with my time and think carefully about the limited time I have. And um, so I think on the whole, it's been positive. Maybe, you know, maybe if I didn't have kids or I didn't want to be the primary caregiver, I'd be in a different place. And maybe I would be considering a full-time executive role. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm 49, I'm almost 50. I have so many careers ahead of me. I can do that in the future. You know, I still have time to do all of that. So I think on the whole, it's been, you know, the, the trading floor makes you very efficient and very quick. Having kids makes you even more efficient. <laughs> And much quicker and much better at multitasking. And so to some extent, I think it's been positive for me. And, um, but, but, you know, not always. I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes being a parent has been the hardest thing I've ever done. And I go to work for relief. <laughs> you know, so some people, you know, some people talk about this work-life balance and I, I just don't think that exists. I think sometimes you know, work is all consuming and sometimes life is all consuming and sometimes work gives back and sometimes life gets, gives back. And as long as it's uh, doing this and it doesn't get stuck in one space, then you're in a good place, I think. So, so it, true. it is always finding that balance, um, but it doesn't sit like this. It sits like this and then sometimes <laughs> this and then that's right. Yeah. I, in my book, uh, which is about the future of work, I talk about work-life blend in response to work-life balance, because I think from a slightly different point of view, you know, from more of a philosophical point of view or scientific point of view, it's like I, I look at people that have inspired me, like Einstein, like Nietzsche, you know, like um, Newton, like these people, it's not like they had life, work-life balance. It wasn't like, okay, now it's five o'clock. I'm not going to think about E equals, uh, you know, MC square anymore. Now I'm going to go home. And, and if they, they thought about it like that, they would have never become the people that they beca became. You know, these were all people who had that constant um engagement and a connection to their work, you know, and their work was... um was their life, you know? Yeah. So for anybody who wants that kind of level of, um, you know, success or, or achievement or, you know, however you call it, you know, the uh, passion in, in what they do, they do need to have that level of connection, which is what, you know, you're talking about. Uh, but of course, when you do have children, but on that topic, actually, I want to ask you a question about being the primary provider earner as a, a woman. Um, I think we don't have a previous paradigm for dealing with this because we are coming to a point now that uh, there are more and more women who are becoming successful. Uh, you know, a platform like FemPeak is designed to help women to get to the peak of their potential. So um, uh, ironically, I was on a, a date some time ago and I was talking to the person, uh, I was like, look, you know, we are uh, good friends, we are having fun, but you know that I don't want children. So if you want children, you need to just, you know, go and find someone else, right? <laughs> and, and- uh, oh, I bet that was a mood killer. <laughs> well, well, you know, he said that, um, yeah, but first of all, I need to find the right person for the job. <laughs> That's how the design, <laughs> for the right person for the job of, you know, having his kids. And then he was like, and of course, that person is not somebody that would be on Fan Peak. It's like, that's interesting, right? I, so this seems like just by um, positioning Fan Peak as a place where uh, women come to reach their peak potential, a man looking at that, you know, is thinking that 
I don't want a woman who is reaching their peak potential, or I don't want a woman as a mother who is going to, you know, because if, if a woman is pursuing their peak potential, they don't want to be, uh, they're not going to be a good mother or something like that. And I was like, why would you say that? Like, there are a lot of amazing women on FemGeek that, you know, that could be great mothers and be successful. You know? you know, I mean, it's so interesting to me, this issue of whether women should work or not. Um, when and whether should. they should be primary. It's like, you know, it's like, how can you be really successful? And what if you become more successful financially than the man, you know, and, and how would that impact? Yeah. the? Yeah, I mean, look, I think so. It's a huge luxury problem to be talking about whether women should work or not. Mm -hmm. um, because where I grew up in Louisiana, which is a very rural area and not one that would be described as very wealthy. Um, and certainly I didn't grow up with any wealth to speak of. There was never, ever, I in my whole life, I never heard the conversation of whether a woman should work or not. Because both parents, both adults, all adults had to have a job or else they didn't eat and neither did the kids. So, you know, you needed both incomes to support. So they were equally important um, and roughly about the same level, frankly. Um, and the idea that a woman should be home was odd, really strange. And I remember, you know, first coming to New York City, I, you know, when I left MIT, um, well, I mean, MIT clearly was like a whole nother world compared to Louisiana, but then I went to Wall Street and was fascinated by the idea that most of the men around me, it seemed, um, one, were intimidated by me, um, and two, would never have considered me as a partner um, because they were looking for that woman to have children and, and manage their household, you know, which is interesting to me because it's unpaid work. And I think you find this in very particular bubbles of, you know, like London, New York, uh, you know, San Francisco, LA, or, you know, Paris, whatever, you know, very wealthy communities where suddenly what wealth should give you options and in and instead for women, it kind of reduces our options and pushes us in a different direction. I find that interesting. Um, so when I first got pregnant and the first thing my boss said, first thing was, are you gonna come back to work? And I was so shocked that that was, I was so shocked that that was his, his response. Cause in my world where I grew up, there was no choice. Mm -hmm. You know, there just wasn't a choice. There's this idea that, you know, women from the 60s fought um, so that they could work. And what they're now seeing is that women now have the option of working or not. And there are many, many, you know, women who were on this journey before us are sitting there saying, no, 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 you don't have the option. You know, we fought so you could work. So, mm -hmm. and, um, and women today are saying, Yes, but we're fighting for the option to make our own choice. And it's, you know, we're on a different part of the journey. I think this is actually a good place to kind of bring our conversation towards the end because it almost shows that, almost, it, it shows that my point that I always say that we don't have a previous paradigm for how to deal with this. We are at a crossroad in human history where women for the first time, uh, are coming to the type of positions of power that they've never had to this degree uh, in, in the sense that, look, if, if you think about right now, the world is run by 10 corporations, five in China, five in America. All of them, you know, 10 tech giants, all of them are founded and run by men. In my lifetime, I want to see that change. And that's what Fempeak is about. And in my lifetime, when we see this uh, change, we know that we don't know how to deal with the consequences of that. You know, like there is going to be a knock-on effect, so, uh, psychologically, socially, 
um, you know, socioeconomically uh, and in terms of the way that we think of our roles as men and women, um, the, the way that our biology is designed for, you know, most of the time women, like you said, in the cavemen era, women have been designed to look up, to find, uh, to marry up, you know, and uh, men have been designed to marry down and look down, you know, in the sense of like finding somebody who is less economically powerful so they can wrap their uh, arms around that person and then, you know, uh, have that person depend on them so that then that, that person will go and have children, etc. That is changing. But by that changing, we don't yet understand fully what our next um, level of society is going to look like, what the next generation is going to look like. Married to that is the fact that we are merging with technology. Like we are literally merging with it. And that's the whole tech philosopher in me comes in. Like, like I, I mentioned to you about my mug earlier, you know, that is going to get to my phone. This ring, I always give an example of, you know, it, it's always with me. It, uh, uh, captures every movement I have during the day. It even knows when I ate too late. You know, it sends me a message every morning. The first thing I look at my phone is my score, my sleep score, you know, my uh, readiness score, right? And, and, but that ring I has think not- that's called an addiction. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, it's just like, it's, it's just, uh, I really like monitoring data, you know, and, and I want to understand. <laughs> and one of the things that I, I always give this example of the fact that this ring was not designed by a woman. And that's why it uh, doesn't recognize when I'm about to have my period. It thinks that I'm ill, you know, it says like, oh, your heart rate is, you know, or your temp body temperature. And uh, we have a problem now with women not being in the forefront of designing these technologies and running these big corporations. We have a problem. We need to close that gap. But by closing that gap, we open up a new can of worms, you know, and a new paradigm that needs to be addressed. And one of the other titles I give myself is a transition architect. You know, we are in this position of, um, having to go through a very speedy transition. And we don't know, uh, we, we don't have a previous way of having dealt with it. There's no historical precedence. So we don't really know what the next step is gonna look like. And this is both fascinating and exciting. It's also terrifying. Yeah, look, you know, I mean, it's, it's super interesting um, where we are. And I would put out two, questions for you or thoughts or challenges. The first is part of me, again, wonders if this is a bit of a socioeconomic phenomenon, um, because if you're poor, you're not having this conversation, right? You're not, you don't care where the money comes in the door. You know, both individuals need to be supporting the family, full stop. So, you know, there is a little bit of a luxury question around what we're talking about. And two, I would say that, you know, at, at the moment, there seem to be only two paradigms. So one is the man's the primary earner or the woman's the primary earner, you know, and you can see that in all the media, right? So you either see, you know, the more traditional man being the primary earner and woman juggling and being primary caregiver, or you see, the devil wears Prada, yeah. right? And you see an unbelievably successful woman who seems to have a completely messed up life because of her success. Um, you know, we don't have any balance around the conversation, you know, and the idea that it has to be one or the other is completely crazy to me. You know, why can't, why can't we share responsibilities? Why can't we both, you know, have successful careers? And why are we even measuring one versus the other? Um, you know, and socially, we don't see enough of this, of these sorts of role models where that balance happens. Um, and so the challenge, of course, is that, you know, men that might be coming from a more traditional or conservative background, um, if they only see two paradigms, one doesn't work for them at all, right? And, you know, we need to be able to put forward a slightly different paradigm, one that is balanced. Yeah, 
Amazing. Yes, absolutely. That's a that's a fantastic closing remark. And I will take that away and, uh, you know, and, and think about it. And I completely agree with you. Uh, I think we do need a, a third way of, you know, thinking of it. And that's why I'm saying this is such an interesting time in history. And I, I'm excited every morning I wake up. I'm so excited to be living at this time because I feel like we are going to see uh, a really important change in human uh, history in this century at uh, the way that we are merging with technology and uh, it becomes a uh, part of our lives. But uh, I also have this, this always this question of whether technology is a life form in itself and it's co-evolving with us you know mm. it's, it's not because we often talk of technology as a set of tools and techniques that enhances our lives but actually technology is using us too. you know think about machine learning machine learning yeah. is using us to learn to you know to come up with its own new ways of uh, processing data and uh, at some point it may not even need us anymore right so we are um, and we are already seeing in machine learning uh, where we don't know and oh, exactly. Oh, you're talking about the matrix, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that is true. Like the matrix is an absolute classic and I often think that we are living in the matrix. <laughs> All right, thank All right. you. Cheers. Cheers, bye. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Terry Duhan. Be sure to check out Terry's TEDx talk and follow her on LinkedIn. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider subscribing on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or any other one of your favorite podcast channels. And don't forget to give it a five-star rating and write a review. Finally, if you're not yet a member of FMP, head over to fempeak.ai, register, and join a community that actively supports women's professional growth.